Well, good morning, Fabric. Uh, yeah, come, keep on coming in and have a seat. And happy Mother's Day. Uh, happy Mother's Day is always one of those uh, complicated holidays um, because there are the upsides and the downsides of people's experiences with mothering and being mothered. But uh, nonetheless, I think we all have something that brought us into the world, and we're all part of giving birth to things in this world, so that's a, a good thing to celebrate and honor all those people and that role in all of our lives. Uh, a uh, special welcome to anybody who's uh, listening on the podcast. Uh, we wish you were here, but we're glad you're listening. So, uh, yeah, so good. Uh, there is an outline on the back of your Sunday paper if you want to follow along on that. It's going to be a little bit more casual this week because we're, um, I'm going to be talking with Annie Mogish Mason today. So, you know, a little um, uh, more conversational, but uh, nonetheless, that might be a good place for you to keep your own ideas and thoughts and put them down as well. But I do have something to, um, to tell you all, and it's the same thing I told you last week, but I want to tell it to you again because I think in this complicated and kind of messed up world we maybe feel like we're in a lot, it's something that we need to hear, and it is simply this. You have permission to have hope, okay? And I'm going to make you do the same thing I made you do last week. So turn to someone and actually shake their hand and tell them, you have permission to have hope, all right? And, and then say it back. So I'm going I'm to add something onto it, and I think that's going to come out this week. Like you have permission to have hope, but you don't have permission to be naive. All right, you don't have to. You don't have permission to just live your life with wishful thinking. All right, hope. Hope is more substantive than that. Hope is built on something that um, we can really see and are working on, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, this week, the title is "Educating Girls," and I would hope some of you read that and just like, "Ooh, what? Seriously?" And yeah, I kind of meant it to be a little bit. Or what? <laughs> Offensive slightly or something? Like, what? Educating girls? Um, because the fact that we all know that maybe that actually is an issue, but it shouldn't be, is exactly what we want to talk about. And the fact that it's girls is like, that's easy. I mean, most of, when we, for most of us, the person that comes in our mind is a nice middle class white girl. You know, we're forgetting all the other layers of complicated uh, inclusiveness that are being left out of that. It's just one of the places. Education is only one place, and girls is only one of the audiences. But we're living in a world where we're just not operating on all of our cylinders. A uh, metaphor we've been talking about is we're hopping around on one foot, and that's just not going to really work for us very well. So, uh, but I do think what is happening in how we're seeing education move forward and trying to claim a bigger vision is one of the bright spots on the future scape for us, which is what we're talking about these weeks. Uh, so if you are new to this, what is a future scape? Uh, it's a word we made up. I suppose someone else has made it up before us as well. But future scape is when we take this vision of what could be, and then we take a hold of all the stuff that kind of is going around in the world, and we try to create a future that is better than the one that we got right now. We, we can see it. It isn't there yet, but we're going to work on it. And so it isn't wishful thinking. It's the kind of hope that says, I'm going to know the truth. I'm going to, I'm going to take the bits and pieces, and we're going to do what we have to do to get there. And I think that's an important thing for us to do. So, um, and the piece of that that I think really becomes operative in this conversation today is that that future scape has got to be for all of us. And while that maybe seems like a, like a duh, it really is a radical concept, and it's going to be a hard one for us to... Uh, wrap our heads around. So um, there, there's a pat. Well, there's a passage in the Bible I want to just spend a minute with. But before I do that, I got to say something about this. I, I'm not going to quote the Bible or use a piece of the Bible here because I think that proves it, or because we have to do that. Because I don't think we have to, and I don't think I have to try to prove it from it. But the fact is that this idea that the real future scape, this place where real hope and real a life, a real living room exists for all of us, is just intrinsic. It is the message that the Bible is trying to give, not just a message that is in the Bible. And, uh, and, and, I, and one of the problems is that it has been left out, or it's been read in a way where uh, somehow it's become just convenient for us, and it's just left many, many people out of that message. And I think we need to correct that. We need to uh, not let the Bible be used that way. We not, need to not let this tradition that has tried to move us forward and break us open uh, to, to close us off and to keep people out. So there's this one passage, and a guy named Paul, who was one of Jesus' early, uh, well, follower after Jesus' life, uh, he really starts 
trying to bring this message to the world. And he, he writes this. Let each of you look not to your own interests. Okay, just don't think about yourself. But to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. In other words, think the way Jesus was thinking. Have the perspective. Have the, the worldview, the way of understanding life that Jesus did. Who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be seized. Now, that's kind of a, a loaded line, but it's basically what it's getting down to is privilege. Like, what he's saying is that Jesus had the ability to insulate himself, to protect himself, to be living in privilege, but he did not hold on to that. He didn't seize control of that. He... In fact, and it uses this word emptied. Instead, he actually emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, or that word servant. In other words, he, he emptied himself of that privilege in order to be of service to others. That, that word could easily be translated as a slave, not, which can be dangerous in our way of thinking today. But the point is he did not use his privilege to serve himself, but to serve others. Now, Often we think about Jesus and what he did is the message of that is, well, be nice to other people. And this is really way, way beyond that. It's asking us to understand our position in the world, our strength, our power, our authority, as our ability to serve other people and to make sure that it, this world is an all of us world, not just a, a me world. Um, and, you know, and I think that is one of the key things here. And I think as Annie Mogish Mason comes up here and talks to me, you're going to find that she's got a lot of all of us, not just me, kind of message for us to be hearing today. And that's actually on your outlines here. And, and I think this is a question that I invite all of us to be wrestling with, hopefully our whole lives, but certainly today and for the rest of this week. And that is this, is how sure are you that all of us is better than me? I mean, I think most of us intellectually know, well, yeah, what's good for all of us is going to be better for me. It's going to be, you know, if, um, whatever is good for all of us is good for all of us, right? But I don't know that we really feel that down inside. I think we kind of turn into self-preservation. We turn into what's in my best interest, the interest of myself rather than the interest of others. So how sure are you that all of us is better than me or mine, my tribe? Well, with those thoughts, I'd like to invite Annie Mason up here. Annie is, uh, is that the you? So you're the yeah. program director of elementary um, education, but there's, I'm missing a word. Teacher. Teachers, mm -hmm. oh, well, okay. Teach the teachers. Yeah, and uh, just a, a very passionate young woman about a lot of things. Now, I just have to say, as what we're gonna be talking about today, I think is a hard topic, um, and if there's hope to be born here, it's born out of the fact that things aren't really going the way they ought to be going. There's, and so you can find on the bottom of your outline, if you look at it, there are two boxes down here. And the top one says reasons not to have hope. And the one underneath it says reasons to have hope. Now, we could easily just skip the top box and, and fill in the reasons to have hope. But that is, would qualify for what I was talking about as wishful thinking. I think if we're not honest about all the obstacles ahead of us, all the reasons why it's very difficult to have hope today, that... We don't have real honest hope, so it's good to fill those both in. And there's nothing really scripted for those. You'll see one little fill in there, but um, those, are, those are for you to uh, observe yourself and think of yourself. So Annie, so you've got this perspective of training teachers and, and thinkers around elementary pedagogy and of the people that are going to be educating our, you know, raising up our young minds in this world. And uh, you also have a heart that's been broken open for all this damage that has been done to so many people and is still being done for so many people and how they're being left out of the system. And I guess I would also add um, from comments that you said to me that you're also a person for whom the educational system has been, been very successful and friendly, mm -hmm. as it was for me. Um, so taking all that, and how, what, how do you see this world? And what are, what are you, where, where do we need to be thinking and looking? That's a big, big question. That's a really big question, Greg, yeah. <laughs> Take a whack or ask me questions back. Okay. So I think as somebody, like Greg said, who, um, for whom all aspects of the education system wasn't just friendly but was actually made, um, as a white person, as a cisgender straight person, as a middle class person, I never had the experience of school or access to parts of education, part, um, spaces of knowledge, um, feeling constricted for me. People um, always expected you to, to 
go to the next level and to do it well. It Not was only was it expected, but it was easy. The, the right. path was laid for me. Right. Um, challenges that I maybe observed in other people um, felt really separate from me. Mm -hmm. um, and I was really trained as a person to look at that as like someone else's problem. And maybe I had the space to um, to support or help, but not to put myself into that process. Right. So, um, so what was wrong with all those other people that they couldn't do it? You did. <laughs> <laughs> so what was wrong was a system that was yeah. created to support the types of identities that I just listed that I embody every day um, that um, was simultaneously made to lift me up and to, um, to ignore or um, fail to see all the people who have the marginalized identities across all of those categories. Right. So one of, one of the things I think that's been happening then where I'm hoping we can, as a society, can start realizing that by um, really having our system work exceptionally well for a certain segment and, and either, well, making it harder or not making it work as well for other parts mm -hmm. that we're hopping around on one leg. Mm -hmm. I really, I like that image that we're going through life, hopping around on one leg. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I mentioned that comment to you, you were talking right away like, well, what happens when you hop around on one leg? And mm -hmm. what, what, what do you see going on with that? So one thing I want to say first about yeah. the, the metaphor that we spent a fair amount of time kind of riffing on um, is I think I caught both of us already say we about it. Uh. Um, and I, I always <laughs> I talk to my students all the time about being very careful about your we, um, particularly in spaces where dominant identities are dominant. Um, so when I say we about the hopping around on one foot, I'm actually talking about dominant society is walking around on one foot or hopping around on one foot. So first of all, when dominant society hops around on one foot, like Greg just said, we only have the option to keep moving around in the same circle, and it's pretty difficult to step outside of that circle. And then we got on this we, the, the Greg Meyer and Annie Mason we, when we were talking about this, got on this whole thing about that when, we're hop when, when a system is hopping around on one foot, there's a lot in that foot that's, that's up, <laughs> that's not touching the ground. Yeah. Um, there are knowledges, there are experiences, there are ways of being in the world that are um, just hanging there and actually have a tremendous amount of resource in them that when we're hopping around on one foot are untapped. Yeah, and um, well, well, first, on the, the whole we thing is like, ah! <laughs> <laughs> that is so true and that is just so um, unconscious which is like the perfect illustration of, of how this all works mm -hmm. yes and so ouch I'm just that, that's so good thank you so this is another thing that I use when I work with students who are mostly people who will be teachers or who are teachers or like my kids say or the teachers who want to teach the teachers um, when we're talking about how um, life works in society. We re it's really easy for people to get stuck on this, the bottom circle, which is the individual level. So that's the, that's the me instead of the we. Um, and that's one of the ways that I think it becomes so easy to hop around on one foot. You see the world through the lenses that have been, that the world, through which the world has been presented to you. And when I use these concentric circles, I like to remind people that inside the very outside of the individual layer of the circle is institutions, which means every organization that we interact with, we're all interacting with an institution right here, right now, mm -hmm. um, at Fabric, but we're also interacting with you know, the institution of marriage, institutions of schooling, institutions of the government um, at all times that are shaping our individual experiences in the world. And then all those institutions are also within broader systems. And um, I think we'll talk today a fair amount about some of the the shapes and grooves of the broader systems that, um, again, constrain life for some and empower life for others. Right, the, uh, those larger systems that are beyond us have created the pathways, uh, the patterns, like how things work. They've defined all kinds of things, mm -hmm. created categories, you know, looked at the horizon and said, you know, we'll break it down into this, this, and this. They, you know, th cut, the, cut the pie, so to mm -hmm. speak. And then you grow up with that, and just like growing up with the language, you don't even know you know it. Mm -hmm. I, you open your mouth and it comes mm -hmm. out. The same thing happens with these patterns that have been established, mm -hmm. which shows why it's so difficult mm -hmm. to do it. So the system is the air we breathe, right. literally. Um, and, the, and another way people talk about that is we're like fish in a fishbowl, yes. and the system is the water. Right. Fish don't know they're in water. Yeah. yeah we used that illustration a couple of weeks ago. Okay. It's exactly the same thing. So this hopping around on one leg, um, 
Uh, yeah, one is, so we're losing the benefit of that one leg, of the other leg. Mm -hmm. um, we're also, what happens when you hop on one leg is inevitably you'll hop in a circle. Um, so lack of progress, mm -hmm. we're not really getting anywhere. And then all this energy that's required to keep that leg up. I mean, go ahead and try it sometime. Hopping is on the, the one foot that's hopping has a hard job, but the other foot that you're trying to hold up has a huge job too. So the energy, the um, exhaustion of trying to keep that system going that way, this is very, very difficult. Uh, and then, so what happens? We start experiencing that in our bodies, which is something that you were kind of helping me understand when we talked the other day. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that the hopping around on one foot metaphor took me to when Greg brought it up was um, the idea that, um, so thinking about, <laughs> I'm not the best at visuals, but <laughs> so for me, I was, the, I was the foot that was on the ground. Right, I have right. been the foot that was on the ground in most of my life. And for a lot of other people in my life, they've experienced more of life as the foot that's kicked up like this. <laughs> you can um, hop around out here and show us. I thought about that, but I wore these shoes that, that weren't gonna okay, make that easy. Right. <laughs> if anyone else wants to demonstrate, you're welcome to. Um, that, so as a, I'm gonna stick with the cisgender, straight, white, middle class parts of me when I, when I talk about this. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, moving through the world for the number of years I've been here so far, um, navigating, maneuvering things without a whole lot of constraint because of all those identities or related mm -hmm. to all of those identities, um, I also, consistently carry the histories of um, the, the people like me in my family lineage, in my biological lineage, um, who, have who, who have contributed to shaping things that way for me. Um, we, we can call up another slide. <laughs> um, one of the books that I think about a lot that helps me with that is a book by a local person named Resma Menachem called My Grandmother's Hands. Have people seen this book before? couple of my aunt has who's in the room. <laughs> um, one of the things that this author, that Resma really helps people think about, particularly white people who've experienced the world in the ways that we're talking about today, is, um, is that we know a lot about how, if you think about white people compared to black people, for example, we know a lot and have, have the collective we has come to an understanding about how black people whose lineage is, comes from enslaved people, that, that actually has shaped people's DNA. The, the historically, even however many generations after, the experience of being c carried across the oceans in slave ships, um, that becomes part of actually who people are, it becomes part of the fabric of their lives, and they continue to pass that on. Um, what we think about a lot less is how white people or anybody who doesn't, isn't descended from enslaved peoples in the United States, also carries the experiences that their, that their ancestors were part of. And so one of the questions this author asks is, what did, so I can, I can ask this of myself, what did my ancestors have to do, have to let themselves become comfortable with in order to face their daily lives as people who lived in a world where some bodies owned the bodies of other people? Um, and the notion of carrying our histories, with carrying our collective histories within our bodies is a, offers us a reminder that that's still actually in us. And so it's in, it's in our reactions to other people on the street or in a store. It's in our daily decisions. It's in the fact that we end up in spaces that are often racially segregated. Um, it's even in things like landing on a we mm -hmm. um, that, is, that is assuming a we that matches our identities and not others. Right. And, um so when I, when I think about that, like how, how has my body been shaped? Uh, it, I mean, it, it's easy for me to just make that, well, that's kind of a, a metaphor. And I, I hear you and I've read, done some other reading that really says, yes, it is a, it's a powerful metaphor, but it's also reality. <laughs> and um, so I, I think about if I, I grew up in a his, with a history that says, yeah, I am the dominant culture and other cultures, even if this is an unconscious thought, are here to support me and my lifestyle, mm -hmm. to, to grease the, you know, the, the tracks for me. Um, what, so what did, I, what did I have to become comfortable with? And you, as you said, 
saying, well, other people are going to have a really tough life so that I can have a nice one. And somehow, what did I have to do to, in order to ignore that message, mm -hmm. to say, that's okay? Because obviously, if I really faced it, I would, um, I, I, I'm struggling for words. I guess I had to learn to turn part of me off mm -hmm. in order to be able to live with myself and having that privilege. Mm -hmm. and, and that kind of gets back to this other thing, like how, um, um, how much, how well do I believe that all of us actually is better than me? Mm -hmm. and, and if it is true, how do I wake up that side of me that says, no, I don't have to be afraid of what might happen to me if I, if I vote for all of us. I'm actually going to wake up myself. I'm going to live mm -hmm. into my body better mm -hmm. because I'm going to get rid of a message that's actually, or a part of me that's actually harmful to me and mm -hmm. harmful to what I actually want to be about. Mm -hmm. um, I myself, as an individual, am walking around on one leg, mm -hmm. you know, so to speak, mm -hmm. yeah. So, this is, sounds like disruption. Yeah. You're, you're, you want to mess up this cart. You mm -hmm. tip over the apple cart. Mm -hmm. what, what's, what's that look like in education? It, or it's already happening, right? Because mm -hmm. now we have pretty uh, socioeconomically, as we're distributed in the population, that's pretty much who you've got in your, in your teaching programs, right? No. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I knew that was the answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, what, what are you seeing? What, so, what does it look like? What, in the world of education, where are some of these challenges, and what, how do you see it being reflected in, in teacher training? I actually think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to evade your question. <laughs> yeah, you. I think that um, I don't see a lot yet, and I hold on to my yet there of what you're asking about, but what I do see is opportunities for institutions like education, and, and the part of it that I'm part of is, is the preparing of teachers, mm -hmm. what I see are opportunities for those, those representatives of dominant society to learn from youth. Um, and I see some wakings up of, our, of the opportunities to learn from youth. I think that young people, the young people I'm spending time with in this moment of my life are deeply aware of the fact of, of what we were just talking about with our ancestors. They're also deeply aware that we're gonna be somebody else's ancestors pretty soon. Um, and that we have to be accountable to the same question. So going back to the question of what did my ancestors have to learn to turn off, like you said, um, in their experiences with the world so that they could handle living in the time that they did live in and move on with their lives and maybe come to appreciate the riches that came their way because of that. Um, somebody's gonna ask that question about me in a couple of generations. What did I have to um, turn off in myself to live in this world? Um, so, so we have, we have permission to have hope, and um, we have that accountability, right. or we, we need to demand that accountability of ourselves. So I see, I see the opportunity to turn our attention to youth who are already living into that accountability in really different ways around things like, I'm sure a lot of people here are familiar with, for example, the renaming of Justice Page Middle School, just a couple, not e probably not even a mile away from here. Mm -hmm. um, just, yep. Um, the soon-to-be new name of one of the parks on the southeast side. Um, all these movements are being led by youth. Um, we have ethnic studies programs in St. Paul Public Schools being fought for by the youth, and adults are figuring out how to get out of their way and be space-making leaders um, for the youth who are the ones who are driving the ideas. Okay, so, um, yeah, I, th that is... Uh, um, hopeful, and I, I, I'd like to jump into what you were talk, how you were beginning to talk about leadership, because this mm -hmm. is difficult. Uh, I'm just going to imagine myself as a teacher of a room full of middle school kids, and uh, I have this ideal, I, you know, that they're, all these students are going to teach me and so on, and after about three weeks of what I perceive experience as behavioral problems and lack of paying attention and getting their homework done and, and filling out their papers right, I just want to discount them, say mm -hmm. they need just plain need to mm -hmm. listen to me. I want mm -hmm. to assert my authority. It's obviously about them. Yeah. yeah. Because I, I, I had the ideals, but it wore, I wore out in three weeks. So where, where, how, do, how do we understand this role of authority or leadership? I know mm -hmm. that's one of the things on our, mm -hmm. on our outlines as well, mm -hmm. but... Walk us through mm -hmm. how you understand leadership, what it can okay. be like. 
I'm going to get there, and then I'm going to yeah, also you're... evade your question a little bit again. <laughs> with another thing. That's your job. <laughs> That's why you're here. Um, another thing that that I've been thinking a lot about lately, and that I, I offer back to teachers a lot um, when they tell a story like the one you just told in an imaginary mm -hmm. way, um, is to borrow a phrase from a friend of mine. That sounds like a you problem. So when you went in thinking that you knew what to do, you mm -hmm. and this gets into some of the authority questions. You're the teacher, you had the training, you have the degrees, you know what to do, and then these kids got in your way. Um, <laughs> What's that about? Yeah, <laughs> but we all do that. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know where my kids went, but if they're still in the room, I wish they were, I'd love it if they weighed in here. <laughs> they think about this a lot too. <laughs> um, and it's really hard then to say, like we have so many beliefs about how power and authority work, and it's not, it's so difficult for adults and often teachers are among those to, to turn our attention back on like, what did I do in this moment that, um, or in this series of interactions with this child that, that made it seem like I just needed to throw my hands up and forget everything that I thought I knew and believed about children and just bring a really harsh form of authority onto them. Yeah, I think that's really, totally true. And also, maybe it's some of our expectation that if I did do the right thing, everything would just work. Mm -hmm. And again, partly, for a lot of reasons, the world doesn't work that way. Right. Just because you do the right thing at what moment doesn't mean that all of a sudden you've you know, turned the secret key and, mm -hmm. and the gate opens for you. And it also fits in with the fact that we have this generational memory within our bodies. You don't, you don't have one African-American president for eight years, and all of a sudden, mm -hmm. we got over racism. That yep you know, was developed over hundreds of years and so on, uh, hopefully pushed some things in the right direction, but it, it didn't just change things for us. So like in any moment where, going back to your fake story about you as the middle school teacher, you are there in your body mm -hmm. and you're interacting with this group of kids, um, but the, the, the way that Greg and I are constructing the world here, you're actually so much more than you and that group of kids. You're carrying all of those histories, all of those institutional interactions. And in many cases, um, when we're talking about teachers and kids in schools, the, the teacher is not only representative of those institutions, but it's also often actually a white body responsible for the, the care and learning in that moment of children of color, sometimes white children as well, um, but, but all of whom are carrying these really complex histories and individual experiences into the interaction. Um, maybe we should go to that, right? Yeah. There's a, the, uh, a picture, kind of a, a kid's drawing. So, without doing a ton of audience interaction, could, are a couple people willing to just holler out things that you notice about this picture, especially in the context of what we've been talking about the last couple minutes? What's the setting, do you think? Heading into school. Yep. Heading into school. Heading into school, yeah. Under a rain cloud, Under a rain cloud yeah. But on a sunny day. Mm -hmm. The sun shining everywhere else, and it's raining over this one person. Um, what does his path to the building look like as they follow this cloud by themselves? It's not direct. That backpack is really heavy. You can see it taking the posture even down. He has to walk past this physical reminder of of many institutions and systems to do it, yeah. Yeah, a flag. Yeah. yeah. I, I noticed too. I, I noticed this because you mentioned it to me earlier. <laughs> but but the character. Great job. Yeah, I'm, I'm good. <laughs> the um, the character has a lot of nuance to him, her, mm -hmm. um, and a lot of uh, what rat, kind of molded lines and everything else and. And I look at around the rest of the picture, and I just see how angular it is, mm -hmm. straight, cut and dried kind of. There's all this complexity to the child yeah, who's let's... trying to get into this building that doesn't look like it's, it's interested. Doesn't fit, yeah. So this image was, pops into my mind a lot, <laughs> but popped into my mind when you were describing the fictional interaction between you mm -hmm. and children in the classroom because um, so often the people who are in the powerful positions to have a conversation about um, 
why, why are those children in that classroom so resistant to all of the amazing things that you're trying to teach them? Why can't they just get on board? Um, <laughs> this picture lives in my head most of the time as a constant reminder that of, of what is actually, what actually might be going on for them in that interaction and what, um, what sometimes literal lengths they had to go to to get in, to even get themselves into that space to interact with this teacher. Mm -hmm. um, and once again, all of the difficulty that is being carried in their actual bodies when, when they try to figure out how to let you teach them. Right. All the um, things of like kind of life and warmth are behind. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, that's, it's a, a telling picture. So, mm -hmm. so to think about that. So, um, all I can say, Annie, is that you're making this way too hard for me, though. Mm -hmm. All right? I just want to, like, I want to look at the world, and I know what to do, and I can just go do it. You're making it way too complicated mm -hmm. for me. Mm -hmm. And I say that sarcastically, obviously. Um, My students don't. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's, that's, that's the reality, right? So if we want to talk about, if we're going to have hope, it's because we're being honest. Like, um, I'm going to think about this picture before I go stand up in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to realize, you know, why... Why are they not tracking you with me? They're not seeing this classroom the same way mm -hmm. I am. This is a me problem. It's, yeah, this it's is about what, what I understand about the world, about their lives. And, and it doesn't mean that I'm bad or I'm wrong necessarily, mm -hmm. but it's like, where can I make the change? Mm -hmm. I can't change you. Mm -hmm. I can open myself up. I can, I can work with who I am, and that's the real moldable thing for me. And so am I willing to do that or not? Is mm -hmm. all of us better than me? Yeah. You know, that's that, that question. So you, you find this on your Sunday paper too, but this comfort zone, danger zone, growth zone. Now, we talk about that a lot here as Fabric, and um, I think this is a huge one for us because the world without disruption, the world that is about me and is, it fits my way of understanding the world is all of that, is that comfort zone. And everything else is out in that danger zone. Mm -hmm. And I just do everything I can to stay out of that. And what, what we're talking about here is finding a way of pushing those two apart and inserting this growth zone, mm -hmm. which initially probably isn't terribly comfortable. Mm -hmm. Actually, as long as it stays a, comfort, a growth zone, it probably will never be comfortable. Mm -hmm. But we need, we need to do this. I mean. Yeah, I think it's important as we imagine that those zones in our own minds that the comfort zone also isn't benign because the comfort zone is that space where my ancestors learned to turn off part of themselves in order to withstand the violence that they were bringing upon the world beyond them. Mm -hmm. And so whatever, you know, if you think about, oops, it's gone, think about the kid, <laughs> the kid with the rain cloud under them, um, that, that's my comfort zone. That the world that that kid lives in every day is the comfort zone that I was raised, that I came up in the world um, living within. And I would have walked past that kid because I was excited to see my teacher and talk to them about the book I'd read over the weekend, probably. Um, and so my comfort zone had impact, um, direct impact on the lives of other people. So it, we can't think of the comfort zone as like, well, that's everything going along fine, because for many it's not. Yeah, right. Yeah, comfort zones are, I think, are very dangerous for mm -hmm. all of us. And mm -hmm. Uh, that so is, there's danger on both sides as well as within the growth zone. Yeah, I mean, if, and if, even if I just think about it personally, to have a lot of comfort but have no growth in my life, mm -hmm. doesn't sound like it's a good formula for me. Mm -hmm. right? I, I think I, I need to be out there. Um, what, another thing that I want to make sure we talk about is uh, you'll find, I'll go straight to where it is on the outline, it says, beware the system's ability to absorb, uh, to absorb change but not be changed. Now, we talked about this a lot, and that's one of the reasons why I think there's a lack of hope, is that we've, we know that this the system, the individual institution system, all devised in a way where um, we have all kinds of examples of change, but somehow like they get rendered toothless. They get, they get absorbed without ever changing the system. Mm -hmm. um, and you've had some examples of that and, and some you know, concerns about that. What, what, what about this beast that we're feeding that mm -hmm. seems to just eat up our best intentions and keep, <laughs> and keep things going just the way they always were? Mm -hmm. That's an easy question, I know. Right. <laughs> Push me into my danger zone. Good. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, so the, the beast, when I talk about it, the beast is that outer circle 
that, that I call white supremacy. Um, Resma Menachem calls it white body supremacy to remind us that it actually is people who maintain that beast, mm -hmm. who feed the beast every day um, with things like segregated housing and a segregated school system and massive economic inequality and um, climate change, et cetera. <laughs> These things all feed that beast. Non-acceptance um, of LGBTQ. Yes, um, yeah. Right. Um, so one, I think, one example that I can, that I think a lot of people can probably resonate with about the way that we can feed the beast and the, syst and the system churns that new thing out um, without its teeth on it anymore um, is, is what you, the, the presidency of Barack Obama that you talked about a couple minutes ago. Um, we did experience eight years with, a, with our first, with the country's first black president. Um, and um, in the eight years that he was in power, we also didn't see much, much material change in the lives of the black community. Um, and so we can sell it, we can choose, we can celebrate the fact that we had a first black president, which is incredible. And we also have to see that um, that wasn't a pen, I say this word wrong every time I try. Now I'm gonna say it worse. Go ahead, say it. Panacea. No, that's right. Is that right? Right. <laughs> um, that his space, his busting through all those institutions into the actual top place in the system wasn't actually enough. Um, even though some people really wanted it to be, it wasn't actually enough um, for the system not to keep doing its thing. Yeah. Um, it's gonna take a whole lot more than one really powerful person at the top. Right, yeah. I know Ta-Nehisi Coates, I think he uses the language of it being a salve. We, we take mm -hmm. these things and that make us feel better about the issue um, without actually changing the issue. He, mm -hmm. yes. And he even talks, Ta-Nehisi Coates even talks about himself that way. He says, um, if people haven't read this book, this is a book to spend, spend some time on. He also has an, he uh, narrates the audiobook version of it, which is, I think, especially incredible to listen to. Um, Ta-Nehisi Coates talks about the wild popularity of his own writing um, and how helpful it's been, particularly for white people, to come to an understanding of um, these same questions about like, what did my ancestors have to turn off in order to live in this world? And he tells that story from the perspective of someone who grew up black in this country um, and didn't have the opportunity to have those stories turned off because he was experiencing them in his body in a much more real way. Um, and he, he takes issue with the idea, he opens and closes this book with taking issue with the idea of hope as a self for white people. Um, and I forgot how the questions are phrased in our, in our homework for this week. Oh. Um, but I think that he would, he would have concerns there as well. Um, well, that's not the one. Where's the hope question? It's in there somewhere. <laughs> um, that sometimes we rely on the idea of like, oh, but there's a lot coming as mm -hmm. a way to keep ourselves in the comfort zone, um, bump ourselves away from from the potential dangers of, of leaning into um, really imagining a life beyond. Right, so um, there is, this, I mean, this is just a huge area to dive into and we're you know, not gonna get to it all today. And actually in two weeks, we're gonna be talking about hearing voices and how uh, um, that's the last line there. The voices we need to hear aren't new. We're just starting to listen to them now. Mm -hmm. A lot of us think, oh, these voices have never been there. No, they've been, they've been out the whole time. We're just now beginning to listen to them. Mm -hmm. And I think that's important. So we're going to be kind of talking about the same conversation from a little different angle. And I, I, I know this is a hard conversation, and it's probably one of the more important ones that we have, at least in our society today. And it feels heavy because probably we really haven't seen a lot of progress. Mm -hmm. it is a, it's a tough one for us. So those boxes, like, what are the reasons not to have hope and what are the reasons to have hope? And to be able to hold those in tension with each other, I think are one of the big pieces here. Mm -hmm. um, the, you know, the, I don't know if you noticed it, but the band, the, the two songs that we played just before well this, chosen. one is, um, you know, we'll all be free, and the next one is, none of us are free. <laughs> did, I, did you notice that, mm -hmm. the irony of that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Chris Tripolino, knew that when he chose those songs <laughs> because that is the reality we live with, you know? And, um, and I don't think to sing one or those or the other by themselves really tells the whole truth, does it? So um, I have, have some more thoughts on this at the very end of our gathering today, but I want us to hold this and maybe hopefully have some good discussion around it. Um, 
catch Annie afterwards and talk to her. Uh, let's keep this going on Facebook as you meet with your groups this week. These are some important conversations to talk about and be vulnerable. These are hard things for us. No matter which part of the we you happen to be, um, I think these are conversations for us to speak openly with and everything else. And yeah. Can I do one more push? You can, yes. Thinking again about the, like, watching our we's. <laughs> when we, when, as you all engage in these, is thinking and conversation today and over the rest of the week. I think this very last question before the boxes with the reasons to have or not have hope, um, I would like to offer a rethink of, the, of that question and think about um, that the, the voices that the world needs to hear aren't new. Um, dominant society is just starting to listen to them, is how I would offer a reframe of that question. Um, I, I, because there are, you know, there are faith communities around the country living into the same question really differently all yes. over the country today. Um, and in those spaces, it's not, a, it's, not a, it's not a moment of starting to listen. It's a moment of maybe starting to be heard or recognizing that, um, that they're, the spaces and, and voices that have been shared there for generations are now actually finding more of a space in spaces like this one. That's great. I, I appreciate that. I agree with you on that. And that, that's a, one the, the way I think of we and use it is probably one of the real big tangible takeaways for me this week. That's really great. Cool. Thank you, Annie. Thank you. All right. <laughs>